Dr. Russell uh, Kennedy, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Um, you're, um, you know, you're, uh, you know, you don't know, but your, uh, <laughs> your bio, well, I know me. Your, your bio is, yeah. is exhaustive, right? Like, uh, you know, yeah, don't read the whole thing. No, no, you're a neuroscientist, but you, you know, you start out, you, you have a background in stand up comedy and, uh, and then you, you got your PhD and, and, and now you're, you have a, a book called anxiety, um, RX. RX. Yep. What, now, what does the RX stand for? Medical prescription? Well, no, it stands for prescription, which is funny because, you know, I, I thought that was universal across the world, but I've got people in Australia that have never heard of RX being an abbreviation for prescription. So that that's kind of odd in and of itself. Uh, and, and so why I'm excited to talk to you today, there's a, there's a number of things that uh, topics I want to um, get into. But first, I do want to start off with uh, you. you talk about anxiety versus alarm and as we were sharing before um so many times we mislabel what we're experiencing and and as a result we treat it uh ineffectively and, and then we end up overdosing on some treatment that we think is is supposed to to fix this or heal this thing i have a friend her skin breaks out and and she thinks it's going to be treated with some topical solution. And I'm like, you're, you're take you're eating too many high histamine foods, but you know what? I'm going to let her do what she does. So talk to us, Dr. Kennedy about alarm versus anxiety, please. Yeah. Well, well, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a backstory on that. I was a traditional kind of medical doctor for a long time. I've got a background in neuroscience. I've got a background in developmental psychology, and I was pretty left brained analytical. And all the stuff that went to treat my anxiety, like talk therapy and to some extent EMDR and, and CBT and all those things never really seemed to help me long term. They helped me in the short term, but didn't really help me in the long term. The anxiety or alarm would always come back. So in 2013, I fully ruptured my left Achilles tendon. Uh, because like the arrogant doctor I was at the time, I figured I could inject my antenna with cortisone and it wouldn't rupture, but it did rupture. So anyway, that was kind of like the straw that broke the doctor's back. I was already burned out of medicine and that was my excuse to leave. So in 2013, I'd kind of lost my identity. You know, for a long time, I was this medical doctor and now I knew I was burned out. I knew I wasn't going back. And uh, I was pretty low, you know, I was, I was suicidal and I was... Um, you know, I really didn't know what to do. So a friend of mine who was kind of a plant medicine specialist said, well, why don't we take you on a trip with LSD, which he did. And on that, trip, I'm shortening it down quite a bit, but on that trip with LSD, I saw the alarm in my body as opposed to the anxiety of my mind. So it was the first time that it actually showed me, and I don't know what it is, that this energy that's in me that creates my anxiety, that creates the anxious thoughts is an energy that's been in me since I was a child. And it's in my solar plexus. It's kind of purple. It's dense. Uh, it's kind of crystalline. It's pointy. It's sharp. It's hot. It pushes up against my heart. And this is what I was shown on LSD. And then I sort of came out of the experience and thought, well, what if what if my anxiety isn't in my mind at all? What if it is actually this alarm that's in my body and my mind is just reading that body and reading that alarm and making up a scary story to go along with the scary feeling that's been lodged in there since I was a kid. And that's basically what it came. That's what, that's what basically it comes down to is that I had this revelation on LSD and then later on to some extent on ayahuasca as well and psilocybin that my anxiety really had not a lot to do with my mind. My mind definitely made it worse, no question, but it wasn't the origin. It wasn't the root cause of what I called the anxiety. The root cause is this sense of alarm that was lodged in my body from just growing up with a, with a father who I loved dearly, but would often go manic, depressed, or psychotic, and I would lose him. So the alarm from that, was it's still in me, but I just, I reframe it as, my younger self asking for my attention. And I realize as a medical doctor and a neuroscientist, that sounds pretty woo. That sounds pretty flaky. But until I figured that out and until I was shown that, I didn't really get much better from my anxiety that had, you know, basically crucified me for 30 years. 
Uh, so uh, there's so much to unpack there, <laughs> I, and I hear you talking about your. You talked about your injury. You talked about your mom, your dad. Where was your mom in all this? She was a registered nurse and very dutiful. Right, my mom was from Glasgow. was was born in 1933. Was 10 years old during the the Blitz in Glasgow, where they got bombed every night. And she was in this British family that was kind of, you know, they were connected, but they weren't that loving or or affectionate, right? So my mom always looked after me. I always had a, a roof over my head. I always had food. Um, I always knew that she loved me, but there was no real overt affection and connection that way. So my dad was actually very affectionate and connected, but I learned I couldn't trust him because, you know, as a child, when you see your parent go psychotic, it's a very disturbing experience. So I thought, okay, well, I can't really trust him. And now I put all my eggs into my mom's basket, who isn't really that connected and close and loving. So I kind of felt like I raised myself. I certainly felt like I was separate from the rest of the world. And it was really a painful experience for me. And I, and I think it really lodged in my body and created this sense of alarm in me that eventually became my quote unquote anxiety in my mind. Yeah, I would imagine that would be a painful experience for you, uh, you know, wanting to be loved, wanting affection and love from both parents. And you're getting one from one parent and one from the other, but they're, they're both like on, um, you know, shaky ground. And yeah. um, and so you, you kind of have to figure out how to because you did you grow up an only child also? No, I have a brother. Okay. I have a brother. And, and one of my jokes I used to tell was, you know, my. My father was psychotic and my mother was neurotic. So my own psyche didn't stand much of a chance. And, and so as a kid, then, how did you cope with that? Was, was there like self-defeating behaviors? Was it drugs and alcohol? Did you isolate and withdraw? What, yeah. How did you cope as a kid? Isolated, basically. I, came, I became very much a loner more than anything else. And, you know, I had friends and, and that kind of thing, too. But I, I never really got modeled a close loving connection. So I was thinking about that today, actually, I was like, you know, the friends that I had as a teenager and a young adult, because I didn't really know how to connect and my social engagement system in my, in my body, you know, eye contact, tone of voice, prosody of voice, body language, facial expressions, these things that mature this part of our, our system called the social engagement system that allow us to be connected to other people didn't really mature in me that much until I got older. And then, you know, when you don't have that ability, that social engaged system matured in your system, it's very difficult to be social and engaged. And I think that's one of the reasons why people have social anxiety, which I certainly did when I was younger. And I think I became a stand-up comic, kind of almost like a counterphobic, like something that I was really afraid of. I went right after to see if I could kind of heal it. Kind of like if you're, you know, if you're, paranoid or phobic of spiders, you kind of expose yourself to spiders. It was kind of like the same thing. I was paranoid of, of groups of people in a way. So I became a comedian to kind of overcome that fear on some level. So to, to sidetrack for a second, I see this art piece that you have behind you, right. like two adults with their back to each other and, and they, and they're, but the, their inner child are facing each other. Yeah. And I know that the uh, the listeners won't be able to see this because it'll only be audio. But so my question is, when we talk about the inner child, right? Yeah. Is, is everybody's inner child the same age or is it about the is it the age at which whatever traumatic experience takes place? Like, are we all just nine year olds running around or is it my eight versus your 11 versus your three? Yeah, I mean, I think that if you grew up in a, in a loving attached family, your, your child is part of you. You don't separate from your child. But I think that if you have trauma when you're younger, you know, I have one guy that I see client patient, I don't know what, what to call him these days. Um, and he came around the corner on his bike and he saw this, he was seven years old. He saw this uh, for sale sign on his front lawn. And he just knew intuitively that meant that his parents were splitting up. So there's part of him when he freaks out when someone like with his wife now, his wife just wants to go to the store to get something. As soon as she goes out the door, he freaks out because he goes back to this seven-year-old. And I believe that if we experience a trauma that's too much for our little minds to bear, one, it gets put into our body. And two, we get kind of frozen there 
for the rest of our lives, unless we can kind of go back, make friends, make a relationship with that child that's still in us, that still watched their parents get divorced, that watched your dad hit your mom, that watched, you know, your parent drink themselves into an early grave. Like there's a part of us that gets halted at that age. And as Dr. Gordon Neufeld, my developmental psychology guru mentor says, you know, we grow older, but we don't grow up. Wow, that's powerful. It's so true. You know, I find myself when I'm working, uh, there's a point where uh, my anxiety or my cortisol levels raise to a point, and I will just curl up in a little ball and lay under my desk for yeah. five minutes. And after five minutes of just curling up in that fetal position, I'm ready to get back to work. It's like I must have to hold my my inner child and be like, hey, buddy, how are you? And then, you know, get back to work. So it yeah. speaks to you talking about coming back into the body. Um, can you talk to us about, you, you know, the strategies for uh, when we're experiencing alarm and anxiety? You said, so it sounds like you're saying anxiety is in the mind and in the brain and alarm is in the body. Does it show up? Because for you, it's your solar plexus. Yeah. Does it show up in different places for different people based Absolutely. on certain things? Yeah, there's, there's some frequent flyers for sure. Like I'll see most people feel it around their heart area. Um, some, many people will get it in their solar plexus and many people will get it in their throat. I see a lot of people that couldn't speak what they wanted to say when they were younger, say they were, they were abused. Um, they couldn't say what they wanted to say to their mom. Their mom was narcissistic, very self-centered. Your appearance was everything that mattered. And I couldn't say anything. I see so many people that say, I couldn't say to my parent what was bothering me and they hold a lot of alarm in their throat so basically what i get people to do is is pick a trauma from your life like don't pick the worst trauma ever but pick something that was really traumatic for you when you were younger and then kind of sit back and and scan your body you know pay attention between your chin and your pubic bone in the midline that's usually where it shows up and then see if there's an area that kind of lights up in intensity and if you close your eyes and you really sort of focus on this old trauma, like that patient of mine who came around the corner on his bike, I got him. Okay. Imagine yourself on that bike coming around the corner and seeing that sign. Where do you feel it? And with him, it was in his solar plexus as well. You know, so I got him. It's like, oh, it's in my solar plexus. Is it, does it have a color? Is it hot, cold? Is it burning? Does it have a texture? Is Does it radiate anywhere? And the more we can kind of drill down on that sense of alarm, I feel that that's the source of what we call anxiety. And what you said earlier was really uh, appropriate, Leo. You said that we're often looking in the wrong direction. And I think we're trying to fix the mind and all the stories and the thoughts of the mind when really they're just a byproduct of this alarm that's been held in our body since we were kids. So with him, I got him to find the alarm. And that's what I get with people in general is, you know, think of a trauma and then find where it kind of lights up in your system. You know, some people feel it in their face. A lot of people feel it in their throat, their heart, their solar plexus. Some people feel it in their gut. And then when I get you to localize it, I get you to put your hand over it. And then the other hand on top of that first hand and really focus on finding that, that younger version of yourself. I tend not to use the word inner child very much, especially talking to doctors because they, they kind of zone out when I start doing that, but finding your younger self and then feeling into that, feeling into the sensation, breathing into that. Because one of the things that happens when we get anxious, and I usually use the term alarm, but I'm going to use the term anxious here. One of the things that happens when we get anxious is we have this intense alarm in our body, but we don't notice it because we're wrapped up in our mind. We're wrapped up in the thoughts. But if you look into your body, you'll often find a place that lights up. And what I will say is think of a heartache, think of a broken heart, because that's the kind of energy that it feels like, but it may not feel, you may not feel it over your heart. You may feel that broken heart sensation in your throat or your belly and, you know, put your hand on it, connect with it, breathe into it. And again, you know, as a medical doctor, I want to have a seizure when I start talking about stuff like this, because it sounds so, you know, non-medical, non-reductionist, non, non-cognitive. Non and I think that's part of the problem. I think that we're trying to, to fix a feeling problem with a thinking solution and it just isn't working in medicine and psychotherapy. It's so powerful about put your hand on it, wherever you locate yeah. it uh, for, for two different reasons. One, I realize I'm not adept at touching myself. 
right? I think part of it is a lot of us have grown up with the message that, you know, touching yourself is playing with yourself. And so, you know, I've, I've had this hands off kind of mentality to my body and it's the exact opposite of how I should be um, operating in a way to soothe myself. Because as you mentioned, it is, you know, touching ourselves where the, the pain is or, or where it's lighting up where it can be quite soothing. Right. Um, my girlfriend, when I got this from my therapist, um, uh, she will often, if I'm laying on my back, will come just lay her hands on my chest and press down. And it's the most, I'd, I'll take that over a hug sure. or a kiss any day. Like it's the most soothing, relaxing thing in the world. I don't know what's happening and I don't care. I don't, I don't care if there's research to back it up <laughs> or say that it, whatever. I know yeah. for myself that I feel it's, it's better than any drug. And I, I've taken some stuff because I had a spinal fusion. Okay. Um, and then uh, you also mentioned, um, you know, tapping into what's bothering you. I had a therapist uh, tell me to journal every day uh, the question, what's bothering you? And, yeah. and I was like, wow, I never thought about life in those terms. So can you unpack first the whole, why is placing our hand or touching ourselves? Like what's happening? Like, why is that soothing? Because I think there are listeners who grew up like you were, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not touching myself. Yeah, That's no, and it's true. And I, I think it, it takes me back to the, this old statement that I repeat a lot is like, when you abuse, neglect or abandon a child, the child doesn't stop loving the parent, they stop loving themselves. Right. So when things when things go down in your in, in your home, negative things, the child has to blame themselves because we can't blame our parents because our parents we know are singularly involved in looking after us. So the problem has to be with us. So we start thinking if I could do something more or less better or different, everything would change. And then that's when the inner critic starts. That's when we start taking what I call taking jabs at yourself, which is judgment, abandonment, blame, and shame. That's what jab stands for. Self-judgment, self-abandonment, blame, and self-shame. And when we do that, we split from ourselves. And when we split from ourselves, it's very hard to reconnect. So that's why we have such a hard time connecting to the younger version of ourselves, because we did judge that younger version, that inner child, that younger self as wrong or not good enough. So why would we want to go back and connect with that part of us that we feel is wrong or not good enough? So what happens is we get trapped in our heads thinking over and over and over to escape this pain of this younger self buried in our body when that young that child is really just asking for our attention. And that's why it feels so good when we put our hand over that area, because we're all actually saying, look, I see you. I hear you. I love you. I'm connected with you. And so many times when I'm doing sessions with people, they'll start to cry because this is all that child ever wanted was to be seen, heard, and loved. And because they weren't seen and heard and loved and they had all this trauma in their system, they had to develop what we call defensive accommodation. So they learn how to manipulate. They learn how to be narcissistic. They learn how to lie. They learn how to people please. They learn how to do all these things to get their needs met in a maladaptive way because they couldn't get their needs met in an adaptive attached way. So that's what happens with kids. Like you don't go into a nursery, like a newborn nursery and go that baby over there. That's a narcissist, that baby. That's a people pleaser. You know, these things, we become these things because we're not getting our attachment needs met when we're younger. Not that everything is about attachment, but a lot of things are. And if we don't get that need met, we will find a way to get our needs met in a sort of a maladaptive counterproductive way. And then we will stick with that, that, that behavior, that the chronic worrying, the manipulation, whatever, until we get into adulthood. And then it starts screwing up our relationships. And then we start going, well, now I have to change this, but we don't know how, because we're too busy trying to change the thoughts rather than connecting with ourselves, which is really the root cause of anxiety or alarm in the first place is this lack of connection with ourselves. Wow. That, that's powerful. I, I, first of all, when you said, when we, you know, judge, shame, blame and, and criticize or abuse, neglect the child, it doesn't stop loving the parent. They stop loving themselves. Yeah. And, and that's powerful because then I would explain why so many people get into relationships where, uh, the partner is abusing them 
and they yeah. just can't seem to break that cycle. They probably it's it's a comfortable zone, a comfortable area for them, and uh, and and so even if it's not um, healthy for us, we're gonna fall into what's comfortable, right? Yeah. In terms of relationships. Yeah, and for, yeah, Freud talked about that. He called it the repetition compulsion. So, mm. what was familiar to you in childhood? And the thing about humans, the way we're wired, is whatever's familiar to us in childhood, we will perceive as secure. So, so we will replicate the events of our childhood in our adulthood unconsciously. For example, so my dad would be great for six to 12 to 18 months at a time. And then he would go off the rails and and be admitted to a mental hospital. So I got used to this idea that I can't trust love because it's just going to get taken away from me. Mm. So, so, and I also got used to chaos in my environment because I never knew when this was going to happen. So I created, as I became a young adult, I created chaos in my life. I created uh, I can't work for anybody because I'm not that I can't keep my attention on on a task for very long. So I would get fired from jobs. I had to be home. My mother says you had to be a doctor because you had to work for yourself. So I would create all this chaos. I've been divorced twice. So it was familiar to me. And, and I see that I had a patient and I mentioned this in the book named Jane who had a, an abusive alcoholic for a dad. And basically she was this beautiful woman and she had all this male attention, but she would only pick the abuse of alcoholics to be partnered up with. So we have this, what Freud called the repetition compulsion. What was, what was familiar to you in childhood, what you, what you imprinted on in childhood, you will unconsciously replicate in adulthood. So if you look at your relationships and your parents' relationship, they're surprisingly similar in in many, many ways, because we basically pick people that replicate what our relationship looked like when we were younger. Wow. You, you talk about being um, married or divorced twice, right? And and do you feel like part of that was part of the uh, insecure attachment? Or what would you say was the root of the divorces? I know that's a loaded well, question. Well, no, no. It's, you know, it's a great question. I think that I was expecting my partner's to fulfill the need in me to show me that they love me more than I love myself. Right. So, so initially when you get in these relationships and it's all oxytocin and everything is wonderful and you can't, you want to spend all your time with them and everything's amazing. um, That overrides my old fear of connection. Because chemically, neurochemically, all that oxytocin, all that serotonin gets, you know, goes up into my system. I love everything. I love, you know, when you're falling in love with someone, there's no better time to look around in the world. You know, you see colors differently. You see everything differently because the brain chemicals that go on in your system kind of mask all your trauma in a way. And then, you know, six to 12 weeks that that oxytocin level starts to drop and you start seeing that maybe this other person isn't quite as connected to me as I had hoped. And I think that's the reason why a lot of relationships break up is we expect that other person to love us more than we love ourselves. And of course, that's not going to happen unless you get into a codependent narcissistic bond, which there are many, 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 you know, I know many of my friends, couple friends have this, you know, narcissistic codependent bond. And it's a very, it's a very seductive bond. And one of the things that I that I say is, you know, sometimes when you meet someone, if you have this really, really intense, intense connection with someone, often it's basically mirroring your childhood wounding. That's why it's so intense. And uh, I used to have this joke on stage. It's like, you know, when you, when you fall in love with someone who's not right for you, you know, and, and it's so this fireworks and everything is amazing. The sex is amazing and everything's great. And, you know, and then after a while, your soulmate becomes your cellmate because now you're, now you're handcuffed together right? And you're expecting, each one is expecting the other person to love them more than they love themselves. And of course, that's going to wind up in disaster. Now, you talked about bouncing from job to job, right? And and being fired and you were a comedian um, and and then become a doctor. Was there a sense of like um, identity loss? Because you talked about how there was a, a period where you thought about wanting to end your life. But it yeah. sounds like you stepped away from the, the job. 
And, and so can you talk us through that? Like, what was the thought surrounding wanting to end your life? Well, I, I mean, I became a doctor because I, I'm, I'm intellectual for one level. And, but I love helping people. I love helping people out of, out of pain, out of personal pain, because I think I project myself onto other people and the people that were suffering, say my patients who had a, a mentally ill or alcoholic parent, I really wanted to help them, you know? So it was a way of me kind of getting, getting external validation in a lot of ways. And I didn't actually become a comedian until I was 40. So, so I became a doctor when I was just around 30. And then 10 years in, I realized, you know, this career probably isn't going to fulfill me. So there was a comedy club in my city of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, where I, I live now. I lived in Vancouver for a while when I was doing stand-up regularly and, and commuting out of Vancouver. But I live in Victoria now. There was a, um, a comedy club in Victoria called The Comedy Cellar. And my friend Brad Muse, who was a pharmaceutical rep, saw me at an event because I used to host all the medical events around because I was funny and, and that kind of thing. And he said, you should come down to the comedy club and do a set. And it's like, no way, man. Like, that's way, way out of my league, way out of my, my pay grade. But I went down, I, I got hammered on tequila, and then I went on stage and I actually did fairly well. And at that point, as you know, the stand-up bug is pretty addictive. You know, and again, I think that's that's also the external validation for me, right? So it's like I'm getting all this, you know, attention for being funny and it's and the shows are great. And so it's like this is validation on some level. But even then, it kind of reached a point where, and as you know, traveling with stand-up is it's a soul destroying experience. It really is. And I think as a stand up comedian, I think that we suck a lot of the joy out of life because we're so judgmental because we have to be, we have to observe and judge everything. It's like a lot of comedy is taking stuff that doesn't make sense and then making it sense, make sense to people or something that makes sense and then making it not make sense to people. And then the juxtaposition of all that stuff. So I think as comedians, we look at things with this very harsh eye, this very judgmental eye. And I see a lot of, you know, psychopathology in my fellow comedians, because I think that we look at the world in a very judgmental way. And I think that if you do that, it does change your neurochemistry. I think there's a saying that I love, which is whatever you focus on, you'll get more of. And if you focus on judgment, you'll get more judgment. And if we already have that judgmental voice from our childhood, it just magnifies inside of us and it just gets worse and worse and worse. And, and we have this, this saying, you know, what's bad for your life is good for your comedy. Well, why the F, you know, is something bad for your life? It's like, so I think that was one of the things that really attracted me to stand up because it was like, it was chaotic again. You know, so it was, there was a chaos aspect to it. I didn't know what was going to happen. It was very addictive that way. But again, after a while, it becomes like, this is actually not giving me what I hope for, or it's actually making me feel worse instead of making me feel better. So I don't know if that answers your question, Leo. No, absolutely. And I think it's a powerful point because uh, I just finished reading Anna Karenina and okay. And it's a story, you know, a, very much about a woman who's married and then uh, she meets another guy and there's passion and there's connection. It's kind of like, you know, you're a doctor and then you meet stand up and then there's this passion and connection. Yeah. And then she pursues and um, and leaves her husband for this new guy. But then that passion, passion is not sustainable. Yeah. At some point it wears off, the drug wears off, the oxytocin wears off. And then you have to see, all right, is this something that I still want to be with after all the drugs were off? You know, the, the morning after, it, totally. you know, that, it's that walk of shame if, totally. you, if you want to take that. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so it, it's, it's powerful because a lot of times I think we are pursuing things that, uh, that arouse in us the passion, but we haven't really thought through uh, the sustainability of it. And is it something that we need? Versus something that we just want, you know, like a like a pair of shoes or a car or whatever. Yeah, I mean, James Clear in his book Atomic Habits writes this this piece about, um, you know, a child looking at their presence under the tree gets a bigger dopamine hit on December the twentieth than they actually do opening their presence on Christmas Day. So we are a species that wants to want. And we are very chemically mediated, especially with dopamine. 
So once that dopamine starts to slide off, now we're left with reality. Now we're left with the disappointment. Oh, I thought this person was going to complete me, or I thought this person was really going to love me more than I love myself. And, and then we're faced with the stark reality of our own existence and our own pain. And if we don't deal with that pain, and you, you made a point earlier about touch, and I think touch is one of those things that really helps heal. And I think it's what we hoped we would get when we were younger. I would like nothing more than, than, you know, with watching my dad being taken away to the mental hospital, if my mom would have just put her arm around me and said, you know what, I know this is really difficult for you. I know this is really hard for you and your brother, but you know, I love you. I'm connected to you. Uh, We're going to be okay. She puts her hand on my chest, you know, and I feel better, but because I didn't get that, there is this sort of almost this chemical ghost that's sitting around in my system, waiting, 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 hoping that something else is going to come along and fulfill me and make me feel better. And I was, I'm an accomplishment junkie. I mean, you know, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a comedian, I'm a certified yoga and meditation teacher. Like I, I want to accomplish because I think that it's going to heal me, but it won't, it doesn't. And it's taken me to get into my fifties before I'm like, you know, this is really not what I need. I, it, it feels good at the time, but I think getting older, it's one of those things where you realize that, hey, this is actually more of an addiction. You know, I, I can't actually get enough of what I don't want here. You know, I can't get enough of what I don't want. And, you know, I'm expecting to be validated out of something, you know, beyond me. And, and there's no, that's not sustainable. But I think that as a society, we are trained on Instagram or whatever to look for validation. Oh, if I have these many followers, I'll be happy. If I have this many, this much money, I'll be happy. And I know it's an old song. I know it's an old story that you can't be, you can't get it enough from the outside. And we see like movie stars and and rappers and people that self-destruct because they got it from the outside, but it still wasn't enough. So it's how can, how can we give that to ourselves? There's nothing wrong with wanting external validation. You know, I think we need other people to heal, but if we're not giving anything to ourselves or giving 10% to ourselves and we're expecting 90% from, from outside of us, we're going to live a life in anxiety in alarm in depression in OCD and eating disorders and just in emotional pain. So what does that look like giving to ourselves? Cause I could already hear people going, uh, I mean, being selfish, what does it mean to give to yourself? What does that look like? I think it's a, a first thing is awareness. Like what I write in the book is, is, is this little ABC process is being aware of what you tell yourself when you're feeling alarmed, you know, with me, I have a bit of, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac. So, so when I, I know when I start telling myself that I've got some kind of disease or some kind of process going on, I know that's my tell that's like in poker, that's my tell that tells me I've gone into the rabbit hole. I'm in alarm. Clearly I'm in alarm. Now, what can I do? So that's A, awareness. Be aware of what you tell yourself. Be aware of that feeling. And then B is go into your body. You know, get out of your head because your head will always try and suck you into to, to more and more thinking. It's like Siren Island, that story about Ulysses and, and the sirens. You know, he would, he would sail by and these beautiful women would call to him, the sailors, and the sailors would jump in or run their, their ship aground trying to get to these sirens, which are basically your thoughts. And they just run you aground. They just kill you. So you have to get out of your head and into your body. You know, if it's breath, if it's putting your hand on your chest, if it's, you know, rubbing your thighs, if just get into sensation. I have this thing that I tell people to to cross your hands across the midline, uh, just in front of your chin and put your right fingers on your left cheek and your left fingers on your right cheek and just slowly stroke your cheek like that. Cause that will automatically bring you in a sensation. And when you get into sensation, You get into the moment because the ego has no, that the protective worried ego has no life in the, in the present or no life in the, no life in the present. It only has life in your future worries or your past pain. But if you bring yourself into the present moment, into your body, then you have a platform. You can actually do something about it. And this is where mindfulness comes in and that kind of thing too. But there's also the C part of that. So A is for awareness. Be aware of what you tell yourself. Be aware of the the sensation of when you're going into alarm. B is go into your body and breath, because if you go into sensation, 
all that energy that was devoted into all these negative thoughts and rumination and just going over and over in your mind gets half because now you're, you're into sensation. Now you put a lot of the energy into sensation and some of that energy that was feeding your thoughts is now going into sensation. And the next thing is how do you be compassionate to yourself? How do you, how do you like talk to yourself like you talk to your friend or talk to your child? You know, see if you can be really connected and compassionate to yourself. And this is where I think mindfulness kind of drops the ball a little bit because it gets you into the present moment, sure. But at that point, it just allow, it just believes that being in the present moment is going to heal you. I think that being in the present moment is a great platform to start, but you really have to make an effort at that point. And touch is one of those things that really that really does that. My wife is a somatic trauma therapist. Right. So she deals with trauma. She specializes in people that have trauma before the age of seven. So they don't have a story about it. They don't have a story that we can work on in therapy. So she works on the story of the body. And that's what helps people heal when you. I have so many people come to me and says, I don't remember much of my childhood. And there's a a neuroscience explanation for that too that the that basically the, the hippocampus, which is one of the structures in the brain that integrates memories is paralyzed by cortisol. So when you get stressed as a child, you secrete all this cortisol, the hippocampus doesn't work. And the hippocampus kind of time date stamps your memories to make you think that when they come into awareness, that they're not, that they're coming from the past. So the hippocampus kind of gives us this feeling like this is old, this isn't happening anymore. But the amygdala has the opposite. The amygdala has no sense of time So when the hippocampus is paralyzed and it can't time date stamp that memory, like this coming around the corner, seeing what the real estate sign is from my past, it's, it feels like it's happening right now in the present. So we have to really bring ourselves into the present and sensation is a great way of doing that. And then once we do that, learn how to be compassionate to yourself, learn what you say to yourself, learn how to stop abandoning, how to stop blaming, how to stop shaming yourself. That was a long answer. Sorry, Leo. No, it's it's, it's wonderful. And because I, I know also um, one is, you know, I practice these things. I, I definitely um, I had some thoughts earlier today and uh, and I was like, oh, I need to write that down um, and, and, and just be aware of that and then um, get a sense of it in my body. Um, and, but you know, the compassion part is. Uh, the part I added also, because I was like, of course, Leo, you, you're feeling like that because you didn't get a lot of sleep. You're still a little jet lagged, like, you know, just trying to understand why I was feeling uh, the way I was feeling. Um, so I really appreciate you uh, highlighting that and giving me a, a structure, the ABCs of it, the awareness, body and compassion. Um, but I also know that you have three questions that you say to ask our anxious mind. And I love questions. I think. Uh, I think there was a quote that said the quality of our life is based on the quality of our questions. And so what are those three questions, Dr. Kennedy? So, well, I mean, a lot of this stuff comes from, is, is this true? Is this real? Is what I'm telling myself true? Like, I think that that is such a key, it's such a key issue, but again, it's really important to get into our body first So when we're stressed, when we're anxious, if we've got a letter from, you know, the IRS or whatever, like when we feel that, that tension come up in our system, when we feel that anxiety, it's really important to put your hand on your chest, to breathe into yourself, to stay in sensation with yourself, because you can't solve the the problems of your mind when your mind is in survival mode. So when your body goes into survival, when your body goes into alarm, you've lost your prefrontal cortex anyway. So you can't think anyway. So trying to ruminate and trying to learn something new while you're in alarm is not going to be helpful. What is helpful is learning to teach yourself that when I get alarmed, when I feel anxious, I'm going to go into my body first and foremost, and everything in my mind can wait because your mind, you can't solve the problems of the mind with the mind. You need to actually go into your body, settle your body first. And then you get your rational prefrontal cortex back, the front part of your brain that does a lot of your advanced thinking and morality and that kind of thing. That comes back online. Now you can think. But if you're freaked out about something, there is no point in trying to to solve it while you're freaked out. It's like trying to solve an algebra problem when someone's got a knife to your throat. You're not going to be able to do it. But we keep trying. That's the thing. The way we're wired as human beings is if I keep thinking about this, the answer will come. 
And it won't. It basically just digs you deeper and deeper and deeper into a hole. So if you're, if you, you know, like you said, you're married. If your partner is upset about something and, and, you know, a lot of couples struggle with this where the guy or, or one partner then tries to get into the mind of the other person. Why don't you just do this? Why don't you do that? They, they have all these answers mm -hmm. to their problem. They have all these fixes. Yep. What would something that would be effective for the partner to say or do to help soothe the other person who may not be, uh, might not be aware of these strategies of soothing themselves? Yeah, I, I think, it, again, it's awareness. It's realizing, hey, I'm in the same fight because couples fight about the same things. You know, it's usually the same old story. If you can get used to that, that story, if you know that story, you know, when you're not alarmed, when you're not in it, you know, bring that up with your partner. It's like, hey, I see that we're both feeling actually pretty, you know, pretty secure right now, pretty calm right now. Can we bring that issue up and just notice and just notice and say that to your partner, just notice in your body what starts to come up for you. You know, like if you like the earlier example about about the guy who's, whose wife leaves and or, or whose husband leaves and she just goes into panic, you know, it's like where like, let's just dip our toe in this issue and kind of you see where it lights up in you and I'll see where it lights up in me and we'll see if we can work through this kind of together, you know, and sometimes what I'll do with couples is I'll get them to put their hands on the other person's alarm. You know, so if you feel it in your solar plexus, then she puts her hand on your solar plexus, you put your hand on her heart, you know, just for, and I do this with, with parents and kids too. It's like when, it, when a child or a teenager is alarmed, you know, I get the parent to say, you know, where are you feeling that in your body? And they'll usually say their chest somewhere or whatever. And then I get the adult to put their hand on the, on the child's chest and on their back right behind it. So their, their hands are kind of cupping that area and you don't have to say much. You know, this, this is healing that comes through feeling. And if, you know, if you look at the neuroscience, I mean, it probably works through the insular or insular cortex. You know, I, you heard to talk about Andrew Huberman, who's one of my heroes for sure. Um, we talk about the insula, how the insula relates to our body and how the representation of our body in this insular cortex, in this part of our brain is so important to, to amygdala function and how that starts to trigger our old wounds. Because basically any overreaction, when you see someone losing their shit, I'm sorry for swearing, but when you see somebody losing their stuff, they're in an age regression. Anybody who's, who's having a huge emotional overreaction is in an age regression. And if the two of you, if you're partnered with someone, if the two of you are now six years old, as Dr. Phil says, how's that working for you? Like that's not gonna go very well. So it's learning how, how to bring the issue up and then be aware of the sensations in each other's bodies when that comes up. Like what comes up for you when we talk about, you know, sex or when we talk about money or whatever, where do you feel that in your body? Like, where does that come up and catch it early before it, it, it fluoresces to the point where you're not rational anymore. And you can't, you can't solve the issue because both of you are sitting in alarm. Both of you have lost your prefrontal cortex. So you can't solve the problem anyway so you just do the same dance over and over and over again and nothing gets solved well, first of all i love that word fluoresces i'm gonna add that to the vocabulary <laughs> i appreciate you doc um is there is there anything that we haven't talked about that you like to share with the audience in terms of in terms of strategies that people can practice yeah. right now by themselves we talked about touching ourselves and stroking our cheeks and you know the abcs um i know you've talked about yoga how do you incorporate yoga and and how is that effective in, in the treatment of uh, alarm and anxiety yeah well I, I i think that anxiety or alarm is really on some level a mind body disconnect right so we have this trauma that's stored in our body and we don't want to go down there because it's painful down there in feeling town so we stay in our heads and we overthink and we ruminate. And then the more we ruminate, the more we create a, a more of a separation of our mind and our body. So what yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong all do is they match movement with breath typically. And when you match movement with breath, your mind and body kind of come back in a sink again. And then when your mind and body come back in a sinking again, your blood pressure drops, your heart rate, your heart rate drops, your heart rate variability, which is a, a sign of lower stress comes online and then you start seeing things a lot more clearly 
So it's really connecting with your body and it doesn't have to be vigorous exercise. You know, it's just that sense. I do this kind of free flowing kind of almost Tai Chi kind of thing where I move my, my hands and my breath at the same time. And when I do that, when I join my mind and my body like that, there is this sense of, of unity and a, and a peace that comes from, from just feeling connected to myself. And I think that's so breath work is another thing that I think is amazingly helpful. And, and Huberman talks about that too. You know, the, the physiological sigh, you know, breathe in twice and then breathe out, breathe in twice and then breathe out. That automatically starts dropping our cortisol, dropping our epinephrine. And it creates this sort of sense of well-being. And I'm a big believer in breath work. There's some evidence now saying that five minutes of discomfort a day was it's really helpful or, or, or sympathetic activation, like fight or flight activation, provided you're not in a word, you know, a dangerous situation. And we're starting to use breath work to kind of activate that autonomic nervous system, that sympathetic fight or flight wing of the nervous system to actually create some, some discomfort. And I think that's where Wim Hof stuff works. I think that's where when you go into this ice bath or this ice water or take a cold shower, you're subjecting yourself to this discomfort that automatically kind of locks you into your body. You know, if you're, if you're walking into, you know, 36 degree, 36 degree wa water, you have no choice to, to pay attention. And just like that little exercise that I do with when you cross your hands across the midline and, and, you know, left hand on right cheek, right hand on left cheek, your brain has so much real estate for your hands and your face. Those are the two biggest places of sensation that you can't help but go into sensation. But there is, like I said, some evidence that five minutes a day, and, and I saw this on Huberman's podcast, like I think just yesterday, of kind of activation, somewhat discomfort helps regulate that autonomic nervous system. Because it really is that autonomic nervous system balance that allows us to stay in our rational mind, that allows us to have that feeling of calm, this peace, that things are okay. You know, there's, there's, there's stuff that's going on in my life that I don't like, but you know what? I'm okay with it. And the state of your body really dictates what your mind is going to, what, what your mind is going to do. So if your mind is, is, is going a mile a minute, chances are your body is too. And if you slow your body down, your mind will sort of catch up with it in kind of an ironic way, slow down into it. Because our mind, especially in our society in North America, is going way faster than our body. And it promotes that mind-body disconnection. And that's one of the reasons I think that so many people, especially teenagers, are struggling with anxiety because their mind and their body are completely disconnected from each other. So to answer your original question, I think that's where yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong come in. And you don't have to do an hour practice. You don't have to do a long drawn out thing. It doesn't have to be uncomfortable. It's just basically anything that matches your breath and your movement together will help bring that mind body connection back. And when you have that, you sort of get into this state. And I think it runs through the insula in the, in the insular cortex in the brain that says, Hey, my body's okay, so I must be okay. Uh, it's so true because when our, when we feel dysregulated or struggling with you know indigestion or something like that, then we just think, oh, something is wrong, and then we, we reach for something else to try to fix it. I know, at least for myself, if my stomach is is bothering me on some level, just bloated or gassy, then I just reach for more food, which is preposterous and ridiculous. When really, you know, if I just place my hand on my stomach and just notice it and, and sit with it and have compassion for, you know, maybe I ate something that uh, maybe I ate too much, too little or the wrong combination, just trying to understand it. Um, like you said, have compassion for ourselves and, and what we're experiencing versus, oh, my stomach hurts. My stomach, I, you know, yeah. we, we tend to label things as good and bad. Oh, I feel bad. So then I must be bad. And then that leads us to, quote unquote, bad behaviors, right? And those bad behaviors reinforce that, that negative self-image, which of course creates more negative thoughts, which of course creates more alarm in our system. Because, you know, here's the thing about eating, you know, or, or even smoking or even chewing pens. I'm, I'm a, a massive pen chewer. Like a, a, and what happens is anything oral has a parasympathetic effect right? So there's the autonomic nervous system has two wings, the sympathetic often called fight or flight or accelerator and the parasympathetic, which is often called the rest and digest or the break, right? So anything oral 
you know, through the, through the vagus nerve, through the re recurrent laryngeal nerve, through, through the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, which is basically the largest nerve in our body for the, for the nervous system, that calms us down. So I'm not surprised that people eat to calm down or chew gum or smoke or chew pens because anything oral actually activates that parasympathetic nervous system. So you're actually automatically trying to calm yourself down. And I think that's one of the things. And the other thing is whatever, whatever is the most intense in your system, your, your mind will consciously and unconsciously pay attention to. So if, if for me, if, if I see someone talk about schizophrenia or suicide because my father committed suicide, I will get this rush in my solar plexus. And because the, the rush is so intense, I don't start thinking about my left shoulder or I don't start thinking about my breath. But if I actually focus on it and I actually say, okay, what part of my body actually feels good right now? Can I focus on, you know, the breath as it goes in and out of my nostrils? Can I focus on the roof of my mouth? Can I focus on some area that feels good or neutral as opposed to this alarm in my system? And then what you can do is you can go back and forth between, okay, here's the alarm in my solar plexus. And here's this breathing that feels so good in my sinuses. And then I go, you go back and forth. Peter Levine talks about this, the, the originator of somatic experiencing therapy. It's called pendulation. So, so often we get overwhelmed by this feeling of alarm and we don't even know it's there half the time. We just know we feel anxious and terrible, but really, if you search your body, you'll find this alarm in your system. And if you put your hand over it, if you really allow yourself to feel it and then find a place in your body that doesn't feel it, because like I said, your attention will go to your most intense sensation, right? So what's, what's a sensation that's not as intense, but you can go to. And that teaches your unconscious mind that this alarm sensation isn't all of you. Because when you were seven or when you were 10 or whatever, and you experienced a trauma, that sensation was all of you. There was no escape. You were a child in that situation. You had no agency. You had no way out. But now as an adult, you do have a way out and that you're, you're teaching your unconscious mind, hey, we're not back there anymore. We're here in the present moment. We're not back seven years old. I'm not 12 years old watching my dad being taken away in an ambulance anymore. I'm actually present. And sometimes I'll do that with people. I'll get them to put a picture of their younger self behind their bathroom mirror and talk to that younger self every day. And then talk to yourself in the mirror and talk to that younger child in the picture and then talk to yourself in the mirror. Because what that does is it brings you into the context of the present moment and then that child who still believes that they're seven years old and they're watching that real estate sign on the, on the front lawn of their house, it's still in there. But if you talk to that child and you say, that must have been really hard for you coming around the corner and seeing that real estate sign. And then you look at yourself in the mirror and say, yeah, but I'm here now. I'm here with myself right now. And then you go back to the child. And what that does, I believe, I, I have no science to back this up, but I believe that that shows your amygdala and your hippocampus that you are actually not back there anymore. You're not in this completely overwhelming situation. You're actually here in the present and you're in control of it as opposed to it controlling you. Beautiful. Uh, I, 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 we could talk, there's so much we yeah. could talk about, but uh, I, we're running short on time. Sure. And um, is there a book, a fiction book that um, really uh, gave you insight into you into life into emotions into just any that it just stuck with you you were just like wow this this is a self-help book but it was really more of a fiction a story yeah i mean i'm not one for read like i read a lot of non-science stuff like if i look at my audible here like I've, there's like 150 books in the last year and if i look there was one that i really enjoyed which that now that I look at it was um, you must be joking, Mr. Feynman and Richard Feynman, who is a physicist and a Nobel prize winner. And um, just his stories, just the way, just seeing someone have a completely different view of the world and have it be so entertaining and so funny. Yeah. It's called surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. And it, that book has really stuck with me because he really looks at things in a very, um, analytical way like scientific analytical way 
And there's part of me that loves science. And I think part of me got saved by science in a way, becoming a medical doctor. But I think there's a huge artist part of me that never really got a chance to, to fluoresce. And there's that word again, that never really got a chance to come up. And I think that book really helped me see that other people don't see the world in the same way that I do. Like I know that academically, but it's just that re reading that book and just it being so funny and so entertaining and just seeing just the the irreverent way he looked at life. It was it was really something that really kind of moved me in a way that no other book really has, at least so far. Uh, and what are you looking forward to, Dr. Kennedy? I'm looking forward to the success of my book. I'm looking forward to reaching therapists. I'm looking forward to reaching psychiatrists. It's already happening and showing them that there's a different way of understanding and treating anxiety different than we have now. I think the, what we're doing now is we're trying to treat the thoughts when really the thoughts are just the symptoms. It's not the underlying cause. So I'm really, I'm really loving the fact that my Instagram page has gone like last year at this time, there was 200 people. And I think I've got 16,000 now. It's just that it's really the, the theory is really starting to catch hold. And I get messages from people every day saying, you know, that alarm, feeling that alarm in my body has completely changed the way I look at my anxiety. You know, getting stuff like that really fulfills me. Like I really love changing the way that anxiety is diagnosed and treated. And that's, that's kind of my mission in life because, you know, I, I went through all this pain with my father and I, I remember at 12 years old saying one day I'm going to make all this pain mean something. And that's what I'm doing now. And that's what I'm looking forward to is really helping people not have to suffer with anxiety the way that I did. I love it. And then last question. Uh, well, before I ask the last question, sure. plug all your things, where can people find you? Uh, the book, all that. Yeah. I mean, basically if you Google the anxiety MD, not the anxiety doctor, but the anxiety MD, all my, my YouTube comes up, my Instagram, my, my, my Facebook, everything will come up my website. Um, I wrote a book, uh, called anxiety RX that's available on Amazon. I also did the a narration for it. So it's on audible and, uh, it's sold, uh, almost a thousand copies in the two and a half months it's been out. So I'm really, really happy with the, the narration of the audiobook because I try to be entertaining, uh, while I'm talking about a fairly serious subject, which is basically childhood trauma. Ostensibly the book is about anxiety, but it's really about childhood trauma and it can show up as depression, OCD, eating disorders, all that kind of thing. But really it's about developmental trauma and how to heal that. And then last question, because I always imagine there's one person listening in who may be on the precipice of wanting to end their life. Yep. Before you kill yourself, what would you say to them, Dr. You can't, you can't see the solution from where you're at. Like that's when I was suicidal and it wasn't long, but it was like, I would look right and that was abhorrent. I would look left and that was abhorrent too. And, and you can't see the solution from the place that you're in right now, because my life is immeasurably better than it was in, in January or February of 2013, immeasurably better. And I couldn't have imagined it back then. So you can't see the solution. And just because you can't see the solution from where you're at now, doesn't mean that a solution doesn't exist. I love that. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you so much listeners for tuning in. Remember this podcast is not a substitute for you going to get help. Call the 1-800-SUICIDE or 1-800-273-TALKS. Uh, there's the Trevor Project. There, If you can't talk, you can chat, you can text. There are international phone numbers. I know I have listeners in Taiwan and Bosnia and Budapest and Sri Lanka. Uh, throughout the world, there are international suicide hotline numbers in each and every single one of the show notes. Call, text, chat to somebody who is willing to sit with you in your darkness you can always go to thrivewithleo.com for one-on-one -on -one coaching with yours truly. Let's get to tomorrow together. Thank you so much, Dr. Kennedy. Thank you, Leo. It's been a pleasure talking with you.